So next speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shransom. So uh, I, I think he's uh, uh, did the largest number series in the United States. So please. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks for the uh, privilege of doing this to give a summation of, of what I can find about the experience in the United States. Obviously, things are happening very rapidly now, so I don't claim that this is the be-all and end-all. Uh, disclosures, uh, we do get uh, research support along the lines of endoscopic uh, procedures from Olympus and Boston Scientific. Um, I have to point out that uh, while this all seems very fresh and new, uh, in the United States there is a history of uh, endoscopic myotomy. This is a paper that was published in 1980 uh, by, in the GI journals um, that described 17 clinical patients with achalasia treated endoscopically with a myotomy. Um, and survived. Now this was a transmucosal full thickness myotomy and um, pretty amazing. Not, I mean that's kind of a scary thought and it didn't catch on very much but that's been out there and in the, in the uh, press. So not a totally new concept and certainly desirable to treat achalasia which is diagnosed by endoscopy endoscopically. Um, Jay Pashrika, uh, a surgeon currently at Stanford, soon to move to um, soon to move to um, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, published this uh, abstract at DDW that was quite influential and subsequently a paper came out in 2007 uh, with kind of the, uh, his, his group, um, Gostout and, um, and the others, um, the Apollo group, uh, describing a submucosal endoscopic myotomy uh, in pigs as four survival animals uh, and it was kind of the traditional standard poem technique of dividing just the circular muscle layers. Uh, so really this uh, was the thing I think that stimulated all of us to think about the possibilities of this and I think they deserve a lot of credit uh, even though they're gastroenterologists. I'm just kidding guys. So, so to date in the United States really we've seen the classical uh, poem procedure uh, as described by uh, Professor Inouye and, and Jay Pashrika which is a division only of the circular muscle layer. So submucosal tunnel, division of circular muscle layer and, and really pretty much everybody has adopted that technique. Uh, Professor Inouye of course introduced that to the United States at DDW in 2008. He described his first four cases to a very small room there wasn't a lot of people there, but uh, it generated a lot of enthusiasm and really based on his uh, extensive experience with ESD. And that's continued on. We just heard that he's up to uh, almost 200 cases at this time. Amazing that and he's been very conscientious about publishing the results and influencing uh, the way this is done. So on to the United States experience. Uh, right now, uh, there's currently um, seven centers in the United States that I know of that are currently doing it. The first was in New York State. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, these are the locations of the center. If you have a collision audience and you need to go get it treated, uh, this is where you'd have to travel to. Um, and, and this kind of spans it. Uh, there's a lot of more centers that are on the verge of starting um, a uh, active clinical experience that are in current laboratory that have come out and visited, have, have uh, come and visited Professor Inouye or some of these other centers. So another six or seven centers are on the verge of getting ready to start. So it's really growing quite a bit. As far as I can determine, this is the experience in the United States. Uh, New York State, uh, Dr. Stavropoulos was really the first uh, to describe this in the United States. I'm not sure how many cases they've done to date. I think it's in the, in the tens or uh, less than 20. Uh, but they use a somewhat different technique using balloon dissection. Uh, the UCSD group, uh, who's kind enough to host the poem, postgraduate course, uh, performing 13. Uh, in Portland, we've done uh, currently 38, 39. Um, at the time, 38 at the time of this slide, currently 39. Uh, Northwestern, 16. Bay State, North Shore University, Case Western, Cedar sinai have all had a clinical experience as well in, in Montreal. Um, now I'm sure there's other people out there that have done it and I just haven't caught up with them yet, but uh, anybody else in the room have done some more in the United States? So this is pretty, pretty close to what's, what's out there. So you can see uh, less than 100 cases so far in the United States. Uh, this really difference, I have to put this in perspective of other places um, 
where a very active center, as you'll hear from uh, Professor Fuchs, uh, in Europe and in Asia, where there's a, a large number of these being done. Hong Kong and Shanghai, I believe, have an immense experience of, of over 300, as, uh, as you've heard earlier. This has engendered some really seminal publications. Uh, you saw a little bit of those. Uh, Professor Inouye's published his results uh, most recently in endoscopy, um, uh, describing the outcomes of this. In the United States, there's been some seminal publications from the groups that are doing these, um, uh, including uh, the European group, um, Professor Inouye and his group of papers, uh, my group in Portland uh, has published, and then the Shanghai group uh, and publishing initially their 42 cases, and once again up to over 300 cases now from that group. And then uh, Dr. Stavropoulos um, and their case uh, being published as well. So not a huge volume of, of literature to support this procedure, but I think it's being done very conscientiously. In the United States, all centers are currently doing it under IRB protocol, following these patients carefully with uh, extensive preoperative and postoperative follow-up. So uh, hopefully over the next year or two, we'll see increasing uh, evidence-based uh, uh, data that supports that this is a good procedure. I have to say that next month, we are presenting our six-month comprehensive follow-up at the ASA. Um, and what we found on that, uh, I don't want to spoil our talk there, is we have found a 30% incidence of GERD by 24-hour pH testing, uh, but as Professor Inouye has pointed out and everybody else, a dramatic decrease in the dysphagia scores and very uh, satisfied patients uh, in, the, in that. I think along with this, there's been a great deal of enthusiasm about the treatment of this, and, and courses are happening these days. Uh, um, uh, Jeff Ponsky and his group, Jeff Marks, uh, putting on courses. Uh, there's going to be one in North Shore University um, uh, later on this summer. We're putting on a course uh, in May. So uh, in the United States, it's really a happening thing. It's gathered a lot of interest. It's been said uh, and predicted based on the early experience of this that in three years, laparoscopic heller myotomy may no longer be the gold uh, standard in the United States. I think that remains to be seen, but uh, certainly it shows some uh, promise uh, and evidence that that might be the case. I really have to thank uh, Professor Inouye <laughs> Uh, who's one of the great surgical cowboys of all times and uh, really a hero. He won the Bursi Lifetime Achievement Award last year. He's unable to be um, there to accept it, but uh, he's really educated almost all the surgeons that are doing this in the United States, and I think we all owe him a, a big debt of gratitude for sharing his time and skills uh, so freely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Now, in terms of uh, reimbursement, uh, what is happening in the United States? Do they reimburse as same as uh, the Heller's myotomy, or is it reflux? Yeah, is the codes different? Are the codes or different? Re reimbursement. Reimb yes. Um, yeah. The, 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 We've been billing this under an un, not otherwise specified esophageal surgery uh, code uh, with the same, same um, submitted fee for a Heller myotomy. And uh, so far, we've been quite successful in doing that. Um, I'm sure there'll be uh, regional variations on whether that's acceptable or not, uh, whether it's ethical or, or advisable to bill it as a laparoscopic Heller myotomy, I can't really say. I suspect that will eventually get people in trouble. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> to date. You have a uh, comment? Question? Uh, Paresh Shah, New York. Uh, Professor Inoue, I just uh, have to congratulate you on your leadership and, and tremendous experience in this, and Lee and, and everybody else that started. We're on the verge of it ourselves. Some technical questions uh, with respect to how you've done the poem. In your video, you showed one example of a posterior approach, uh, posterior mucosotomy and extending down to the true angle of his. Uh, my understanding is the majority of your procedures, you make an anterior mucosotomy and do an anterior myotomy all the way down. Have you noticed a difference? Is there, uh, do you get more GERD in the posterior approach where you're actually going through the angle of his? Uh, and have, are there reasons why you've chosen to do an anterior or posterior at different times? I, I may comment a little bit about that and, and strongly advise you to do an anterior lesser curvature um, approach on this because we found it 
to be the angle of hiss approach on the greater curvature is very difficult. The sling fibers kind of fuse to the mucosa a little bit there, the sharp angulation of the angle of hiss, and uh, if you're going to get a mucosal perforation, it's probably because you wandered over on the wrong side of the stomach. Uh, posterior, anterior doesn't really matter that much. It's a little bit harder to move in the tunnel uh, because it's back against the aorta, and you have to worry a little bit about that uh, knife slipping and, and uh, getting into the aorta. But would you agree with that? Yes, uh, I totally agree. So uh, with the curvature, it's better to access. So in that case, uh, when I put the posterior myotomy, uh, the, the patient receives a previous treatment. So this uh, anterior wall was a has a severe scar, so uh, I can find a way only to our uh, posterior wall. That's why I did in that case. But the uh, in, uh, keeps a string muscle, so it's better to cut the rest of the calf. Now, I know that over time you've expanded the indications. Initially, not doing it in people with Botox or with uh, sigmoid esophagus or after. Uh, pneumatic dilation. What what have you found from both a technical standpoint and a results standpoint, Lee or or Hiro, uh, in terms of the does it increase the difficulty in these folks who've had Botox? That's first question. Second question is, we have noted several people with Candida at the time that we do the operation. We've backed out on all of those for fear of blowing Candida into the mediastinum or something. Do you do you have a protocol for pre-op uh, nystatin or something like that? One of our first, I think it was our second case, was it? Uh, we had to postpone because they had candida esophagitis. And we now have a protocol where we put everybody on nystatin five days before their surgery. I think that's, and uh, two days of clear liquids pre op because you consume a lot of time taking the food out of the esophagus. Do you do the same thing? Uh, yes. Clear liquids? Yes. So uh, if uh, uh, the patient has a lot of residue, dilated esophageal patient, so uh, we do. Uh, uh, one day before, the endoscopic uh, take out the, all the residue. Mm -hmm. And yeast, do you see very much yeast infection? Ah, candida, uh, candida infection. Mm -hmm. Yes, sometimes we have, but the uh, just wash. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't postpone the case? Uh, you, no. You don't no. worry about getting it in the, in the tunnel or anything? No. Um, I, I might just mention, uh, as I did my survey, I did ask people about complications they've seen in the United States experience and certainly happy to share ours. Uh, there's been at least two incidences uh, that I've heard of of fairly substantial bleeding into the tunnel. So I think careful hemostasis uh, is key. Um, both those patients didn't need blood transfusions or anything, but they both ended up back. And you, you readmitted yours, you know, so they both ended up for a couple days back in the hospital. I think. One of my first questions when I visited uh, Professor Inouye was, hey, why don't we use a balloon to do this? And he said, no, don't do it. You'll make bleeding. <laughs> and uh, the, the group in New York that uh, were the first in the United States, I believe, uh, use a through-the-scope regular dilating balloon. But um, when we've played around with balloons a little bit, I think Professor Inouye was exactly right. You can get bleeding from that. And uh, nice, careful hemostasis as you create the tunnel is probably a, a good thing. That's the most serious complication I've heard of, although there is a rumor that a patient died on the East Coast uh, following a poem uh, myotomy. Uh, I've never been able to quite substantiate that. It may be an urban myth, but um, it, it's, it's an absolutely true surgery, and I think people have to be careful. Eric? I was just going to comment on the bleeding issue. Um, our very first patient, we ran into significant bleeding as well. Um, and it was more of a um, the patient was very hypertensive during the case, and so we've had the had very close monitoring of uh, conversation with the anesthesia colleagues. So that patient had significant bleeding. We did make a mucosal perforation, and that actually that patient um, uh, had recurrent symptoms and actually failed. And we've salvaged with a Heller myotomy. Um, but so bleeding can be a, a significant problem, and so I, I think that the. Uh, the not using a balloon, using the saline injection with epinephrine really helps the, uh, to decrease that, that bleeding and keeping the, keeping the systolic blood pressure um, about 100 or so. Yeah. And now to answer your question, the Botox does make it more difficult. We've never had an exclusion for Botox or dilatations, uh, but those cases are definitely more tenacious. You actually get muscle fiber kind of stuck to the mucosa so you don't get a nice pretty plane on those. I think people would be wise in their early experience not to do 
probably the Botox folks. We haven't noticed any difference in the dilation, although we had one patient who had a, a balloon dil dilatation perforation, and she was quite difficult. There's a lot of scarring. Yes. Well, I was just going to share sort of our experience with that bleeding that we had, and in fact, it was our fourth patient, or so our last in, at McGill. And um, that patient actually presented, so I reviewed the video of, of the procedure, and we had no bleeding during the case. And the patient came back actually three weeks later with atrial fibrillation. Um, and it was only because I was paranoid that I decided to scan his chest and saw that large hematoma in the uh, submucosal tunnel. Um, but it, it's a bit odd that he would come sort of in a delayed fashion like that. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about what that, you know, he reported no trauma, no coughing, no, nothing specifically that I could relate to why this would have happened. Yeah, I'll, I'll say our, our patient was three days post-operative and had a little bit of retching and um, also was a very dry case. But um, I think that's a possibility. I will also make a comment on our outcomes data. We've had uniformly good success with dysphagia. All of our patients have Eckhart scores of one or zero, but we've had less success with the chest pain. Um, so most of our chest pain patients were better, but not all of them were totally resolved to the chest pain. So I think that, like it is with surgery, is a more difficult uh, group of patients, at least for us. All right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Schroes.